Lynn Lowry, the Glenn Show Bloggingheads.tv. I'm here with John McWhorter. I am a professor of economics and of international and public affairs at uh, Brown University. Uh, and uh, John is at Columbia University where he teaches humanities and is a linguist. Uh, and we are the black guys at bloggingheads.tv and we're back. Uh, John, I'm sorry, I undersold you. I, I should have added, what is your latest book? What are you working on? Oh, you're a great man. I don't mean to Please. not give you the appropriate credits. <laughs> the latest book is Nine Nasty Words and that now has a cover and has gone through the first edits that comes out next spring. And yeah, we'll see where it goes from there actually. Yeah, oh, I'm gonna, on, man. That's gonna, gonna be a blockbuster. Out. It's gonna be a blockbuster. Excuse me for interrupting, but I have to tell I you that. Hope so. You know though, something has happened before we get on with what this this session should be about. But yes, I'm saying sir. this first here. Alison Roman is um one of the food writers at the New York Times. And she took some swipes at Marie Kondo, this person who's interested in having you get rid of things that don't cause you joy. And Chrissy Teigen, who... Oh my God, I don't know who any of these people are, excuse me. Chrissy Teigen is a very pretty model who was married to John Legend, and she's also an entrepreneur, and she's biracial. I don't know much about her either. She's extremely beautiful. That's how it started. Okay, but there's a point people, to all of this now, I'm sure. Anyway, there's, there's a point. Alison Roman has been suspended from the Times for saying some slightly dismissive things about Marie Kondo and um, Chrissy Teigen because it's supposedly racist that she said those things about those women because they're not white. I find that so unconscionable that it has pushed me over the edge and made me decide that my book after nine nasty words is gonna be a manifesto about anti-racism as a religion. I decided this yesterday, I'm gonna write that book and have Terrific, the world dump manure on me. I'm gonna write it. Okay, audience of The Glenn Show, you heard it here first. This is not just the next book. This is the book after the next book. And it's a throwing down the gauntlet. It is, you know, we've been I having this it. conversation. I'm just going to include myself in it, John. I'm sorry. I'm going to be a co-author on the book. No, I'm going to be thanked in the acknowledgement. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been having this conversation at The Glenn Show, and John has been uh, developing what is now more than a metaphor. It, it might actually be a deep insight into the structure of what's happening in our political and intellectual lives around the race question. Anti-racism as a religion uh, and all that that entails. Very exciting, John. Look forward to it. Man. And <laughs> apropos of that, we should indeed introduce the topic du jour, which is uh, racial conflict in America. Uh, the case in Georgia, Ahmad Arbery shot dead by uh, the McMichael family, the father and the son, in an encounter. It's all, I'm not even going to try to summarize it. Uh, called a lynching uh, by many and uh, occasioning a brouhaha. Uh, and uh, now uh, in Minneapolis, uh, the uh, killing of uh, George Floyd is his name. A Houston native, it turns out, John, that my wife Lawan's brother uh, is a friend of, uh, you know, from because the kid grew up in Houston in the third ward in Houston. He actually knows, mm. uh, Pierre uh, actually knows, uh, 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 knew, I should say, knew George Floyd. Really? Uh, and was uh, bereft at the learning of his death, but dying with the police officer's knee pressing his head into the ground and choking him off at the trachea, he can't breathe, he's saying he can't breathe, he's not resisting in any way, what shape or form, and now he's killed. And the aftermath of that, John, which is rioting in the streets of Minneapolis, the precinct across the street from the precinct where these police officers reported is a target, which was being looted. I'm reading in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, people are walking out with big screen TVs from the target shopkeepers, mostly immigrants, up and down the avenue in the vicinity um, are uh, having to stand guard or to watch their places being set ablaze, set ablaze by rioting in the streets. Uh, these are black people. This is about race, about race in America. This is our beat. Our beat is about race. Race is blowing up in our face right now. And the question is, what do we have to say about it? I'm so glad I'm talking to you. Me too, Glenn, because this is, this is some stuff. And I've really been thinking about it because you have to allow that you, you might be wrong. And I don't mean to sound all high and mighty, but if you really are trying to get to the truth, you have to be able to take a deep breath and think, 
have I got this wrong? Like, is all of this disproving everything I've always thought? I don't think the other side ever do that. And that is high and mighty to say. I say that highly and mightily. And I try not to be them. So, so you're starting to think that you may have been wrong? Oh, hell no. But I can consider <laughs> it. Because I'm thinking, you know, this guy gets killed. You know, he's running down the street and, um, you know, he gets, he ends up getting killed. And then here's this person, the knee is on his neck and he dies. And you see this other cop, Asian for the record, but the other cop standing there just watching this, which I find extremely curious. You know, why didn't one of them say, come on, this is my question, Glenn, about both of those things. And this is the sort of thing Coleman Hughes would ask. And he's right. And it seems too clinical to many people, but is the reason that Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd died because they're black? And there's a certain kind of person who says, oh, well, well, you know, eyes rolling. But no, no. The question is, and here's where, you know, they're responsible for really doing some mental work and trying to turn things around. If a white guy had been seen on camera, if I've got the facts right, kind of poking around a construction site over and over again, would the owner of that site not have told those brothers to go check out what looked like that white person jogging down the street? Can we know? Because then if the white person tried to grab the gun, do we know that that couldn't have happened if the person was white? And even with George Floyd, what a tragedy. It, we look at it and we say, they did it because he's black. How do we know they wouldn't have done that to, to Nils Olson? I'm trying to create some white Minnesota. And he's kind of a miscreant. I mean, George Floyd was a, a forger, they say. But let's say that it's Nils Olson, and he keeps on trying to resist. Would those cops not have done exactly what they did because they would have more sympathy for Nils? I don't know how we know that. What do you think? Okay, uh, I think most people's eyes are going to roll back in their head when they hear you say that and say, of course, it's because of race. Well, you mean this is America? And then they're going to tout off all the names, remember the names, Tamir Rice, uh, Michael Brown, et cetera. Of course, this is America. Uh, the cops are racist. It's a long legacy. White supremacy, haven't you heard of it? So at some level, I'm not sure there's anything constructive to be had in litigating the question that you put, although as a theoretical or kind of exercise, an abstract exercise, I think it's not, you know, I'm a social scientist, right? So we deal in causality, right? So what does the evidence show, right? So can you prove, you know, this kind of thing that Roland Fry or people like that with the statistics and they try to go into it. Uh, at that level, no, it, we don't know that it was because of race. And, th and the thing about it is that the hypothetical counterfactual, if he had been white, is never going to be actually observed. It's, you're not, there's no way you can experimentally construct that. So there's a very deep limitation as a matter of statistically rational inference about what you can quote unquote know about such things. But you know how uh, Bill Maher has this thing um, I don't know for a fact that it's true, but I just know it's true. You know, I can't prove it for a fact, but I just, Bill Maher has a little routine that he does sometimes on the show. And then he goes with the comedy and, you know, he'll have 18, uh, I mean, six or eight different, uh, you know, little ditties where, you know, he knows it's true. He knows, for example, that Lindsey Graham's gay. I mean, you know, this is the kind of thing that Bill Maher, <laughs> this, it's a, a little bit like that. I don't, I can't prove it for a statistical fact, but I know it's true that if, you know, you, you know, so, and you can't argue with that. That's part of your religion. I mean, you, there's no, you know, there's no adjudi adjudicating that. That's what they're always going to think. So at some level, I don't find that to be, that. It, but I mean, look it, there obviously is something wrong in police culture when you see behavior like that, regardless of the color of the guy. So we can Definitely. start with that. There's something wrong with police culture because- Definitely. When the police officer who's standing by doesn't intervene in the thing that you and I all saw, you know, and doesn't do anything, well, that's telling me something very deep about the way they're doing business on the daily business and, uh, on a daily basis in that city, and that's obviously an issue. Now, is that a racial issue? Well, again, in terms of causality, probably. <laughs> Historically, it probably has something to do with dealing with crime and miscreants and danger and you know policing in the particular city of minneapolis and i don't know the history there but i'm sure there is one uh you know this is the philando castile territory and whatnot so and there are many incidents i if i knew more i could tick them off so so probably there is some 
thing there that is very interesting as a matter of social history that contributes to the culture of policing that is colored or affected by race. Um, so, I mean, that's one kind of thing you could say, but the other thing, and I don't want to, you know, I want to give you a chance. Um, the other thing is uh, how it gets narrated, how it gets constructed. You know, I mean, race might have been a part of it, but it might have been 5% of it. But now it has become the entire thing. It's become a statement about the nature of race in America. And that's, that's uh, I think, uh, a highly questionable, uh, uh, a very problematic uh, move. I think um, just a couple of things. We have to come back to the point that you know I learned talking to you, which is that nationwide, there are white, usually guys, who are killed by the cops in very similar circumstances to these. And it's a long list. And in terms of the official numbers, black people are killed rather disproportionately, but actually it's not, it's not nearly as stark as people would suppose. White men are killed by the police under undefensible, indefensible circumstances constantly in the United States. And we well, just more white men than more white media. men than black men, for example. Yeah. And so, absolutely um, more, but not relatively more. Right. And so, for example, Philando Castile, I am I don't remember the names as well as I did two or three years ago, but there was a white version of Philando Castile, yeah. not in Minneapolis. But that sort of thing can happen to a white person, too. It just doesn't make the news. I'm not aware of white versions of Arbery or Floyd in terms of exactly what happened to them. But then there's the second thing which is that we're not supposed to ask something, and it's just asking, which is, is the reason that Minneapolis cops kill more black men than white? And apparently they do. There's a figure that has 13 in it. I forget whether it's 13 times more or something. There's some Whatever. figure where she, yeah. So it doesn't happen to Nils Olsen remotely as much. Is it because black people in Minneapolis, and, and wait for this, folks. I'm sorry, but we've been trained not to ask. Is it because black men in Minneapolis commit more crime? And if they do, it's not because there's something wrong with them. It's not to deny that slavery and Jim Crow happened. Maybe it's because of poverty. But is it well, no, that more black you know that? men- You don't know that. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, I'm gonna try to know it. That, that's another one of those things that, you know, you don't have a real factual knowledge of it, but you know it must be true. We know that the crime has to be caused by poverty. It can't be caused by depravity. It can't be caused by bad values, by inhumanity, You're on your own, by exactly. stupidity, by no, craziness, by greed. Wait a minute, no, Nobody's no, stupid. no. Could there, could there not be a moral Except failing in a community? I'm, I'm asking a question. Can mm -hmm. there not be evidence of a moral failing in a community which has a high crime rate? Must it be necessarily the consequences of poverty and, and privation? Come on, what, 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 what kind of theory have we got in human behavior where it's this one dimensional thing where economic circumstances determine everything and there's no room for character, values, and morality? Oh, of course, but what is a moral failing? Where would that A moral failing from? is you have a wallet with money in it that I want and I'm willing to put a pistol against your head, risking blowing your brains out in order to take it. That's a moral failing. A moral failing is because I want the popularity of my gang fellows, I'm willing to go up to a stranger and blow their brains out just to demonstrate that I'm willing to do it, okay? That's a moral failing. A lack of the human empathy that would uh, inhibit you from behaving in ways that are absolutely destructive of the lives of others. So, you know, <laughs> um, but, but but that's a tangent. I forget what the, what the main point is. Well, I was just going to say that I would say that, yes, those are moral failings. I don't like that kind oh, of no, 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 no. Your main point was might not there be a higher rate of cop uh, adverse action against citizens for blacks because there's more black crime. And you say that's yeah. a question that we're not supposed to ask, we're not supposed we're, to say, but Heather, McDonald has, been, Heather yeah. McDonald has been asking that question and answering it in the affirmative for a long time. She's a journalist, mm -hmm. not a social scientist, but she's a smart and well-informed journalist. And she has a point. <laughs> The, the nature and frequency of the encounters between people and the police surely is connected to the likelihood that any one such encounter will escalate into violence. The frequency and the nature of the encounters, okay? How many times are people coming in contact with police, okay? Now, one reason they might be coming into contact with police is because the police have it on their minds that they have to go looking for black people. That could be one reason, but another reason might be because there are more black people in positions 
of law breaking, which occasions the attention of the police. Now the statistics are overwhelming to this effect. Okay, and the nature of the encounter. The encounter is a dynamic interaction between two people. Has the person who's been apprehended got a chip on their shoulder? Do they resist the police? Surely these things are relevant. Might there be a different rate of that behavior relative to race disfavorable to black people? Certainly that's possible. Now whose fault would that be? Okay, so sure. There, the disparity is not ipso facto an evidence of some repressive regime. That's ridiculous. It seems to me to be demonstrably wrong. I think that um, where a lot of people would hear you saying this and just you know be ready to, to throw up a little is that I would add something, which is that you know I'm being a little disingenuous. Yes, almost certainly. I don't know Minneapolis, but yeah, probably black men there commit crimes disproportionately to white men. And we know that because of all the figures that make that inescapably clear in countless cities in the United States. But why? You know, why is it that you know, these kids are killing each other over sneakers? And I would say that it's because starting in about 1960, there were two things. One is that the new black power mood encouraged the sense that the rules are different for black people because of past and present injustice. And that creates, for example, that chip on the shoulder attitude towards the cops, which you'd read about almost never before the second half of the 20th century. And then also the change, and I know you think I exaggerate the effect of this, but the change in welfare laws, which meant that by the 70s, you had these near fatherless communities. That certainly had something to do with the boys behaving this way. And it's changed since, but it imprinted a generation. And so you grow up watching other boys behaving this way, and you have no other model. You don't go anywhere else. And so that might be the reason why you have these disproportions. It's not black depravity, and I would hesitate to call it a moral failing because the boy's never seen anything else. Nevertheless, it can create this effect where, yeah, the fact that the Minneapolis police end up, because they're inept, clearly, you know, there's a problem with the cops, they're going to end up killing more black people because more black people commit crimes. But if you and I say that, we are read out of polite society by a certain segment. But I'm not sure we're saying anything wrong here. Well, we're saying something that's very inconvenient politically. We're saying something that plays in the hands of white supremacists. You know, I mean, we're saying something that sounds like it's mealy mouth apologia for the establishment for the structures of uh, racial domination in the society. And that was well put. We, we being articulate black spokespeople are now putting yeah. a face on something that deserves only unremitting, uh, you know, condemnation and resistance, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm trying to stay in touch with reality. That's all I'm actually trying to do. This is a first order problem, man. Um, uh, as I say, this is going to happen again. The, the, you know, um, let's, I mean, we could review the uh, bidding. I mean, this goes back to the Obama administration. This goes back to uh, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin and whatnot, the origins of Black Lives Matter. Uh, of course, it goes back further than that. There are other incidents, but I mean, this period that we're in right now, uh, with the Twitter and the and the cell phone and and the um, uh, the the kind of instantaneous social media mediated uh, kind of centering of the national attention around them. and then these things grow up and they become larger than larger than life and they become emblematic emblematic of what's going on in the country emblematic of what it means to our children to think of themselves as black they think of themselves as black. You can't turn on the television and I'm watching this uh, very interesting show with my wife, uh, Queen Sugar. Uh, Queen Sugar, this is on the Oprah Network uh, and you can get it at uh, Amazon Prime. And uh, it's a Ava DuVernay uh, uh, executive producer kind of uh, you know, black life in, uh, in uh, New Orleans uh, and, and uh, whatnot in contemporary time. You could go into the details, but you can't every, uh, kind of cultural medium dealing with black life is saturated with this narrative about blacks, the cops, crime, prison. You see how Joe Biden wants to talk to black people? He wants to talk to us about crime, about prisons, about how, you know, I mean, because he thinks, and perhaps not inaccurately, that much of our political sensitivity is going to be driven by this narrative about the thing. So, um, I don't know. I think it's completely wrong, John. I think I think black people in poor cities need the cops. They need the cops. They need public safety. They need security. 
the main threat to the quality of their life is not the being preyed upon by cops, it's being victimized by other black people. That's just a fact, it's just a fact, okay? So if we're interested in the quality of life, among the things, of course, to which we should attend is, you know, bad behaving cops who are hurting people and uh, hurting black people, of course we should not ignore that. But can we kind of keep this thing in proportion? The tail wags the dog here. We need the cops, okay? Cultivating a sensibility in our people of distrust and contempt for the cops is self-destructive. <laughs> it, it's wrong-headed, it's wrong-headed. And then it gets us into these uh, moral problems where I, I fear that you may be in danger of falling, my friend, where we can't call something that is barbaric and horrific what it is. You say you don't wanna make any judgments. You don't wanna call it. Man, if you are killing people, that's evil, that's bad. That's not just a social artifact. It's not just something that we have to get used to because unfortunately people don't have jobs. It's contemptible. And the rioting, the rioting is contemptible. It deserves unreserved condemnation. When people pour out of their houses into the streets with the intent to assault and to uh, destroy other people's property. There's no warrant for that. There's no justification for it whatsoever. Are you sure there isn't, though? Yeah. Are you I, sure? Can that's you my really? Claim. Tell, me, tell me why I'm wrong. Mike, Mike you... because, because the entire social compact depends upon me thinking that. Uh -huh, that but... we, can't, we can't be making exceptions, except when somebody in your group gets unjustly killed by the police other than that, you don't set fire to the guys, uh, uh, to the immigrant market that's on the corner. You don't but, go into the department store and steal. For what? What are you, what are you asserting? What are you showing? You're asserting your, your sense of selfhood, and, and you have to, I don't pardon you, it. Is that what you think they're well, doing? It, really? Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On one level, I look at that, and I am as disgusted as you are. But on the other hand, take this person. He's a guy. Yeah, I'm going to give him a name. Let's call him Omar. That's a little old fashioned now, but Omar. Omar is about 26 years old. He grew up in the ghetto. He's only known other Omars. And, you know, his, you know, the generation a little older than him, half of them have gone to prison. Their whole sense of what masculinity is, is based on a certain street conception of it. And more to the point, they have grown up in the 90s and afterward. Omar has grown up in the 90s and afterward. <laughs> And he has learned a conception of blackness where he and his people are fundamentally oppressed by racism and fundamentally oppressed by the cops. He doesn't know anything about the white versions of Tamir Rice, et cetera. What he knows is that the cops hate black men. He's not gonna learn anything else because frankly, he's not a reader. That's not where he gets his information. He's a very, through no fault of his own, he's a very parochial <coughs> person. Excuse me. So what he hears about is George Floyd basically being choked by a cop and he figures, He's going to go get his. He's going to go steal some TVs because this is a society that's against him and the white man deserves it. And that's all he knows. That's the only language he's ever grown up with. Is he really such a moral reprobate or is he just deeply ignorant through no fault of his own? I get it. I get Omar. I see it. I wouldn't have him in my house, but I can uh, see where I, that I would come from. I reject him. what you're saying. He's a moral no? reprobate. No, he's not through no fault of his own. Are you kidding me? He has no agency oh, over whether or not he becomes a thief. No, and and uh, he's ignorant. Well, he well may be ignorant. Uh, certainly, one thing is true: he's ignorant of there being any consequence to his behavior, because the powers that be and their intellectual handmaidens like you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I say with respect. That I love you. I love you. Uh, are, giving, are giving him a ready-made excuse. Uh, what he Just sees it. <coughs> He's seizing an opportunity. <clears throat> it's like, uh, <laughs> I think of Ed, uh, Ed Banfield's uh, book, The Unheavenly City, where he has a chapter called Rioting Mainly for Fun and Profit, <coughs> uh, which is notorious. The book is notorious. Notorious neoconservative, uh, you know, Moynihan-esque uh, reading of the uh, urban malaise of the 1960s in a, in a very uh, uh, pinched an ungenerous way. That, that's what I mean by, uh, uh, by Banfield's book. But, but I don't believe this fellow is expressing anything other than self-indulgence and greed and maybe joining the party 
because we've been given license. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking back to the Obama administration. I'm thinking back to the uh, response to uh, rioting in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and to the response to rioting in Baltimore, and to the talk on editorial pages about showing restraint and about people having a right to protest, okay? Mm -hmm. When people are setting fire to other people's shit, okay? When they're walking and they're stealing and they're, and they're behaving in, in uh, as I say, contemptible, uh, in a contemptible way. Can you explain it? <coughs> is there a psychosocial argument about how it is that a phenomenon such as a riot might come to pass? Sure. If I want to think about it as a, you know, social, sociological or sociopolitical phenomenon, I may be able to look across societies or over time, find some correlates with this or that aspect of what's going on in a society that tells me it's more or less likely that an event like this will take place. Uh, can I explain the small scale psychodynamics of it when I see one and then another, and then another person venturing from their homes and then everybody starts to flow along with the crowd uh, and, and do the whatever? Sure, uh, you can give some accounts like that. But I'm saying what should be our considered reaction to it? And I claim it should be contempt. Uh, this should this should be sanctioned. These people should be punished. The ones who can be identified on camera should be held responsible for the crimes that they're committing. Sure. No newspaper editorial writer should say, I understand this because black people have suffered. That's complete bullshit. It is it is actually uh, profoundly disrespectful of African Americans. Uh, it, it, it shows contempt for the obligations of citizenship. You don't uh -huh. get the you don't get to go out and riot. Uh, because uh, injustice uh, uh, occurred to you. That's not well. Uh, well, let's, let, let's, and, let's and believe me. There, and believe me, there will be consequences of it. You don't think there's political reaction to this? You don't think that most Americans watching this come away from this less sympathetic to to the people who are engaged in this behavior? You, you don't think they're not showing their asses when they behave like this? That they're behaving like, you know? Well, let's let's try this. Uh, I still cannot hate Omer because I do a mental exercise of imagining. I, I, don't, hate him. I don't hate him, John. Condem I can't condemn him. Okay. okay. I, I can't because it's all he ever knew. We have to imagine what a small bubble Omer grew up in. But editorialists who come out and pardon this sort of thing, if that's the main point they're making, now here I am saying this, but I'm saying it within a much larger point. But I blame, this is going to sound like Heather McDonald with this idea of black leaders. You know, she always writes as if they're these, these ministers like in 1930 who could kind of wave a magic wand. But it's, it's the leaders who are the issue. And these days, it's not the ministers. It's not some grand figure like A. Philip Randolph. Frankly, it's the people who speak and write. And nowadays, it's less the writing than the speaking. You can just see it on YouTube, you know, what people say on TV. A lot of the writers are people we talk about they end up creating something that trickles into the larger community as a mood, which is that it's okay to do things like that. But Glenn, I want you to really imagine, like one time I was spending some time in an inner city setting and it was intimate time and I'll just leave it there, but it was, it was such <laughs> that I was able to really listen to very uneducated people talking a lot. One of them in particular. And this was about 30 years ago. You got my attention, John. You ought to put it in the memoir. You ought to put it in the memoir. <laughs> and she said, to general approbation, they were talking about South Africa. This is how long ago it was. And she was saying, you know, they're down there in South Africa, the Zulus and the Fosas, and they have their societies. And then the white people come in and take them over in 10 minutes. Some black people must have let those people in. And everybody's, oh, yeah, <laughs> snapping their fingers. That's not what happened in South no, Africa 300 <laughs> years ago. It's nobody left them in. But they've got this Judas notion, this notion of what the black conservative is. And this was long ago. I had no standing. They weren't performing for me. But yeah, somebody must have let them in. No one here had any kind of education. No one here read the newspaper. This is the sort of thing they pass around. And they consider this, and I have full respect for them, but they consider this to all be a sophisticated discussion of what they were calling current events. You know, they, I'm sure they learned that term in school, current events. This was the insight. That's what we're talking about. And I'm not talking down these people, but that, that's 
how much they know. So imagine Omar. Omar comes from that. And so he figures the white man is on my neck. You know, anybody like you and me are the people letting the white people in. So he's going to go take a TV. Yes, he deserves censure by those who are more responsible and have broader horizons. Yes, definitely. But I can't frown when I see that footage of people burning down the target, et cetera. They don't. It's so condescending. I'm sorry. Well, we guess, I don't I know agree, any better. Agree about that, man. I, I can't. I can't agree with that. Not at all. I mean, uh, yeah. I, but no, also, but I've, I've, I've said my piece, so let me not repeat myself. So what about? Um, I don't know. The fact that I feel burned on all these things, and that Trayvon Martin turned out to be completely different from what it was. Mike Brown, what we were told, Mike Brown turned out to be completely different. What I've learned from most of these things is that unless it's really stark like Walter Scott being shot in the back by a policeman when he's running away from the car. Unless it's really stark. The real story is always completely different from what we're told. And so with Arbery, we don't really know yet. Even with Floyd, we don't know what went before. There's a lot of footage we haven't seen that the cops took themselves. So we have these conversations two minutes after it happened that often end up being worthless in terms of what's later revealed to be the case. And I wonder if that's what's going on with Arbery and or Floyd. I don't know, but you know, there are things that it would be better if we knew before we pronounced upon. That's certainly true. I, you know, I can't agree more with that. The pronunciations come way too quickly and the facts often turn out to be different. And I know we could parse them. I'm not really uh, all that enthused about doing so, but if you insist, I mean, we can go over how the McMichaels came into confrontation with Ahmed Arbery uh, down there in Georgia, and we could talk about what happened in in, in Minneapolis. Well, you and I don't want to do that because we both are thinking we kind of went through that with Camille Foster last week and we figure everybody can listen to the details of the Arbery case in particular when they listen to the Camille podcast where we all got together again. It's okay for me to mention that here, right? Oh, okay. sure, of course. So Camille Foster, I, I don't want to go through uh, all that again. What does he call it? Uh, the What does he call it? Fifth Fifth, fifth column, the fifth yeah, column podcast. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we don't have to rehash all of that. But no, what I was going to say was that you just asserted something that many, many, many people would dispute, namely that we didn't know what happened in the Trayvon Martin incident. And, you know, it came out, this is with Joel Gilbert's film and uh, whatnot, that George Zimmerman might not have been entirely as was portrayed and Trayvon Martin's behavior might not have been entirely as big then. Most people, I would say most people, most people that I encounter, most woke people don't know what you're talking about when you say that. They say it's reprehensible that you would even give any credence to the mm -hmm. conspiracy theorist Joe Gilbert and his, you know, whatever. And I don't want to rehash the thing about Trayvon Martin. This is the thing that I want to say. The, 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 these are socially constructed phenomena. They're, they're not just what happened. They're what we ultimately make of whatever may have happened, about which we don't have 100% perfect information, but on which information, whatever we do have, we will have constructed some very elaborate uh, ideational uh, entity, something that you know incorporates all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, Sabrina Fulton, this is Trayvon Martin's mother, is running for political office in Dade County. She's a celebrity. I just saw an interview of her uh, at a black radio uh, uh, web radio site that uh, uh, in which she's coming out, you know, she's been asked with the Ahmed Arbery case, which has some similarity to the Trayvon Martin case, both of these young men shot dead uh, by non-black arrest, yeah. by non-black citizens who were not duly uh, authorized police officers, but were nevertheless armed and in an encounter that became violent killed these uh, two uh, black men, young black men. That's Trayvon Martin and Ahmed Arbery. And Sabrina Fulton is being asked by the interviewer about how she feels. And she's lamenting everything that happened to her son. And she's basically assuming that exactly the same happened uh, to uh, Ahmed Arbery. Now, here's what I'm telling you. This, this uh, who'd you call him, Omar? Uh, in his yeah. ilk. In his ilk, that's all they're ever going to know about what happened to Ahmed Arbery. That's all right. they're ever going to know. All they're ever going to know is that it's the same thing that happened to Trayvon Martin, which they don't know what happened to him either. Right. You're not, you can't tell them anything. And one of the reasons that you can't tell them anything is that the cultural establishment of the country won't let you tell them anything. No, it won't. It, once this thing gets set in stone, you can't go back on it. Mothers of the movement, this is at the Democratic National Convention. 
this is 2016, but you're gonna see the same thing this time around with the pandering Joe Biden. We didn't even talk, we didn't even put that on our agenda about Joe Biden and uh, you ain't black. <laughs> right? Because by the way, John, you ain't black. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, but what I'm saying is the truth hardly matters here. And one of the reasons that it hardly matters is that extremely powerful cultural forces and political forces have an interest in reinforcing a certain kind of narrative, a certain family of narratives uh, on behalf of the religion that you have uh, laid bare, that you have exposed. Um, and that's what's going on and it has real consequences. And I'm trying to remain in touch with reality. I, I, I don't wanna be so mired in everybody else's fictitious constructions about the nature of race in this country uh, that I tell my kid, I don't have one who's 18 years old, my kids are older now, but if I had one that I'd be telling them, uh, you know, growing up upper middle class, one of the richest people of African descent on the planet, this would be my kid, okay? With every privilege, one of the most powerful and empowered and privileged human beings ever to have walked on the planet, <laughs> who happens to have brown skin. And I have him going around thinking that that determines his whole fucking life. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do that to my kid, you know? But that's what's happening. That's exactly what's going on right now as we speak. Yeah, it's funny because yeah, yeah, what you're talking about is there's a certain kind of black parent who teaches their child, or the child also learns it from the media, that the way to feel special as a black person is to have that fashion sense as a victim. You know, so that I'm supposed to think that if I decided to jog through even my Jackson Heights neighborhood, and you're I don't jogging jog, while black, you're jogging well. Yeah, but that I'm supposed to be a little worried that somebody's going to see me running and think that I've got a TV under my shirt or a gun or something because of my brown skin. And that frankly isn't true. That's not to say that what happened to Arbery was not a hideous tragedy, but yeah, we're supposed to be afraid to do anything while black because of all these incidents. And we had our conversation two summers ago about Starbucks in the swimming pool. And Starbucks in the swimming pool, that, that was not about murder. But still, I think it bears mentioning as we go into summer, where even despite the virus, we're gonna start seeing more things like this, that those things do happen. I don't mean the murders, but just things like what happened to that guy in Central Park, for example, where a woman pulls the race card on him and says, I'm gonna tell the cops that a black man is bothering me when he was a, a, a mild-mannered, bespectacled birder. Standing uh, there uh, a Harvard BA, <laughs> bird-watching guy out there with his binoculars at six o'clock in the morning. Year old. Yeah, uh, and so to... she's, gonna, she's gonna pull that. Those things do not define black existence. And I don't mean that we must not let those things define us. I mean, that they don't. The media makes it seem like you and me go through something like that every two weeks. That is not the case. Those things are gathered in the media. They should be discussed. But that is not what it's like to be a black person. Okay, so somebody's going to say, and I should say it here, that in the case that you have at hand, this is the Coopers. I don't remember their first name, but it happens that both their names are Cooper. A black yeah. guy out uh, bird watching early in the morning, a white woman out walking her cocker spaniel uh, dog. Uh, and uh, they encounter each other, and the dog is off the leash. And he asked her to put it on the leash, which is required in the ramble in there in Central Park, which is the area, and that's the rule that the dog has to be on the leash. And they get into a dispute. And uh, how's it go, John? He's uh, uh, taping her, and she's saying, "Don't do it," or she, um, she gets her phone. She, yeah, she yeah. Stop recording the encounter. He's got his phone out recording the encounter. Right. He ultimately, goes viral. She gets fired from her job for this, John, and loses the dog. <laughs> or she took the dog back. I'm not sure what the <laughs> circumstances were under which right. that happened. But anyway, your point is this is not uh, emblematic or characteristic of African American male and even life. He has said, and even he has said that he's not sure that her life should have been ruined. Yeah, he, he thinks that it was racism, but the firing and having her become this uh, emblem of racism is unfair to her yeah. and overreacting. Yeah, and I mean, those things are unpardonable. She's a disgusting little person to have pulled that. She frankly seemed a little neurotic, a little odd, but yeah, there's something wrong with her, I get the feeling, but not clinically. She's, she's just, she's an asshole. And well, she no, pulled that and, and I wanted to, that, but what still. I wanted to say was it's that she um, invokes or evokes this, um, this type, which is the damsel in distress white woman right. being assaulted by a black man and plays into a trope so that right. by bringing the police to the scene, 
she would be enacting out the kind of thing that Ta-Nehisi Coates would put in one of his books, right? I mean, exactly. one of these, you know, instances of racial domination and white power being enforced right. against the person of an African American who's just trying to, you know, catch mm -hmm. an early bird watch. Um, mm -hmm. So that so that's the thing the the idea that the stereotype of the threatening black male would have been believed by the police officers brought to the scene that she right. could confidently know that the cops would be on her side that she could anticipate that he would be intimidated by her invocation of the possibility of calling police all of this and this is a real part of race in the country and the and it has to do with history and also has to do with the fact that there are people robbing people in Central Park who are black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And she sorry, is sorry. <laughs> she's small enough. And she's small enough. Yeah, especially after the recent case. We don't need to talk about the Central Park seven. So, so if you were gonna discuss yeah. the racial dimensions of it, you should discuss all of the racial dimensions of the encounter and all of the things that are being brought into focus in this uh in this uh, anecdotal incident, not just the uh religion, the anti-racism religion ones. But, I think it's important to say about the Cooper case that all of that is true and the columns are already being written and you know yes there's a there's a narrative our friend Charles Blow has written you know the perfect piece about all of those dynamics and those dynamics are real you know black boys killed a white student at my school you know about 10 minutes ago and this woman actually has the nerve to play upon those tropes based upon this little issue of did her they catch did they catch the killers of that girl off at least yes they finally they finally did and so yes she's disgusting but what we're supposed to take from it you know you talk about the ta Coates code's anecdote is that that's what mr cooper's life is that it's not just something that happened to him one day when he was 56 that's right and then some other thing that maybe happened to him when he was 36 you know some right. occasional thing in a very blessed life we're supposed to think that that's what happens to us all the time and the thing is, he ran into a really shitty little person. That happened. He won, frankly, um, because he taped it for one thing. And he's gonna go go on, and he's gonna live a life. Bad things happen occasionally to almost everybody. And when it comes to a black person, well, sometimes the bad thing is gonna involve residual racism. Let that me just add. Let me that we haven't progressed since 1925. That would be Coleman Hughes's point, and it's your point too, and it's absolutely correct. Uh, uh, rather than looking at the anecdote, uh, which is not emblematic of the day-to-day -day life, uh, look at how things have changed over some longer period of time. Uh, but uh, what I was gonna add to what you were saying was it's not only that we might overemphasize in terms of characterizing what our lives are like, incidents of that kind, it's that we might persuade ourselves to live in anticipation of and in fear of such incidents, to live on a hair trigger, to live ready to be affronted, you know, to, to, to become addicted to the outrage of being a victimized in this way. So that it happening in once when I'm 35 and once when I'm 60 is just not often enough. You know, I'm almost longing for it to happen to confirm this thing because I'm walking around tight and balled up and, and angry and and uh you know every time i encounter a white person but here's the other thing that i want to say john um one day perhaps not long from now you're going to see groups of white people when white persons are victimized by black criminals publicly massing to demand the punishment of the criminal mm -hmm. that's a prediction that's where we're headed we're headed. If you can go in Minneapolis, they went to the cop's house, the cop who put his knee on uh, George, George Floyd. Floyd. They went to his house. They threw buckets of red paint on his driveway and wrote murderer. Okay, and he's cowering with his family inside or whatever. I have no idea what he's doing, but you know. Um, and okay, I get that. I mean, I understand that, uh, you know, he is a murderer. I'm not disputing that. I, mean, I saw the tape just like everybody else. It was outrageous. You know, I've already spoken to that. But just be careful what you do here, okay? You're racializing this thing. And believe me, there's a lot of Tinder. There's a lot of uh, uh, stuff that can uh, catch on fire that's just laying around dry and ready for a match to be struck to it. You know, one day, one day we're going to see white people publicly demonstrating. We're going to see pieces written in quasi-respectable outlets that catalog the number of black 
uh, uh, awful and unspeakable crimes against white people, okay? Because they're happening. You can and I dread that now. day. I just want to be clear. I dread the day. The reason I'm making the statement is because I hope to ward it off by encouraging a more balanced and de-racialized discussion of these issues. Race is only one and usually not the most significant thing that's going on. You know, I want to get a little story on record, just for the, for the record, that illustrates how this sort of thing can play out, this sort of oversensitivity. I live in a, a co-op building and it surrounds a garden. That's how Jackson Heights works. There are about 10 of these. And, you know, each building has about 12 families and there are about 10 buildings. And so it's a little, it's a little community. Now, I am the only black man in these buildings. And the reason traces to rather overt residential racism in this neighborhood back in the 50s and 60s. And I've even looked this up to see what it was. There was an outcry against the possibility of a housing project being built in this neighborhood, so they put it somewhere else. And you know, the neighborhood does change vastly exactly where they put that housing project. And so that there was, the, there was this fight ab about that. And so there's no, there was no black housing project. And that means that in these buildings, there doesn't happen to be a black person. You used to not be allowed to be Jewish either. Well, that's, that's changed but there are very few black American people in Jackson Heights. I can count about 10 that I recognize by face. Now, what you're supposed to say today is that that's because of racism in Jackson Heights. Whereas the Jackson Heights that I live in is full of New York Times reading, NPR listening, you know, kind of pesto and Chardonnay white people, the kind who are not <laughs> racist in any real way. I don't think you would even get this Cooper lady. In this in this neighborhood, these are America's least racist white people, except I'm the subtle the racism of their condescension and their soft bigotry of, of low expectations. Honestly, there would be some of that, but this is the, I'm talking too long. Here's the, the episode: okay. a beautiful garden, and there are rules about people tromping around in the flowers and things now that it's spring. My two daughters, you know, both of whom are, you know, one is one is high yellow, the other one is about my color. They were running around a little bit in one of the gardens because they were interested in one of the flowers. And so a complaint came to me the other day where somebody, and I'll never know who it was, said that they think it was my kids who, and I'm, I'm sure they guessed based on the fact that I'm the one brown face, they think it's my kids who were tromping around in the garden and that's about to stop. Now, oh, wow. I thought to myself, I know how I feel, which is that there's a whole business in this complex and all over Jackson Heights about whether kids are allowed to tromp around in the gardens in these co-ops. It's been going on for decades. So I thought, whoops, Dolly and Vanessa didn't know that they're not supposed to run around in that patch out them. Then I thought to myself, if I were a good black person, I would be thinking that it's possibly racism. Yeah, if it was two little white girls running around in that garden, this person yeah. wouldn't have said anything. I say yeah. bullshit. Frankly, I'm pretty sure what segment of person it was who said that, they would have called white kids on it too. They called on my daughters because they don't want anybody tromping around in the garden. It wasn't racial, but I'm supposed to think that that was racism raising its ugly head in my little complex, when frankly it wasn't. But if I were a different kind of black person, I would be brushing myself off and thinking it's never truly gone. I don't believe it. I just can't see it that way, but I guess that makes me a Pollyanna. Well, what you're balancing, I guess it's like type one and type two error in statistics or something like that. I mean, you're balancing if you're a black person and you have things happen to you and you don't know whether or not it's because of your race, you're balancing the cost of going around all the time on this hair trigger, you know, because you're always looking for the affront of the races against the retroactive regret of being treated in a way because of your race and not having steeled yourself for that. Or, you know, and to, you know, if, if you let down your guard, you know, if, if you decide that you're gonna go, uh, you know, without, without the shield, you know, and, and just live, just be a person. And then there will be racists out there who'll be treating you in racist ways, but because you're not primed for it, you don't react to it, you don't hate it, you don't, you know, you just take it. It just happens to you because it's one of the things that happens in life. A, a person might decide to do that just to be unburdened from this, this horrible thing, which, which is mm -hmm. to have to constantly wonder whether or not they did it to me because I was black. For example, we're trying to sell a house here. Hey, everybody out here, 92 Keene 
K W E N E Street, Providence, Rhode Island. Look us up. <laughs> <laughs> You're moving? We're, we're on the market, man. And unfortunately, we had a buyer. I'm telling you a story just like you told me a story. And the buyer, uh, because of COVID-19 lockdown, exercised their option to back out of the, mm. of the transaction in the 10-day period. And uh, we lost our buyer. So now we're sitting here, we bought a house. We bought the new house and we still got the old house, man. Believe me, that's not good. Uh, now, so the question arises, we have some people come through and nobody has yet made an offer. Our house is recognizably the house of an African-American. It's got photographs in it. It's got artwork on the walls. It, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, an Afrocentric museum. It's not. <laughs> but if you if you spent time in our house, you would guess if asked that the people who lived there were black. Yeah. Now, my lovely wife wonders whether or not we're not getting an offer because people don't want to buy a house from black people. It's been said that's a thing. Yeah, it could be that this is my point. I'm giving you an example precisely because of this point. Now, they could be true. How much time am I going to spend thinking about that or taking down family photos from the walls to try to guard against it? I'm not going to do that. I was told to do that by realtors when I moved here. Yeah. You depersonalize it. Yes, I know. But I mean, and you could say that regardless of race, you could say depersonalize it in general because people can see themselves in it more readily if you don't have your face staring back at them. But we're living here. Mm -hmm. You know, but but uh, the, 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 the other side is I might be gullible. I might be ignoring this thing when this thing is a very real threat to my financial well-being of which I am not taking significant cognizance, sufficient cognizance. So, you know, you, you have to worry and, about that. And this, the way I end up seeing it is that um, with the cases where you really can't know, and I think in both of our cases here, you can't, in your case, you can't know. In my case, I would be paranoid to assume that it was. I think yours yeah. is tougher than mine. But to obsess over it the way a lot of people do is an evidence of insecurity. And it's funny because they often think that we don't like ourselves. But if you've got a life, and if your life is a life like everybody else's, where whatever is going on with little Lady Cooper is about one thousandth of a percent of it, why would you be that interested in it? You know, because every now and then when I encounter something like, you know, that, that woman or something where it's obvious that my color got me misread in some way, including sometimes when I have a slight conflict with somebody white where I can tell that they're waiting for me to get upset in a certain way because I'm black. They're worried that I'm going to play the race card. So sometimes you can smell that. I mean, just smell it, but it's probably there. I just figure... I'm not going to think about that 10 minutes later because I've got a book to read. I'm not going to think about that 10 minutes later because I'm going to make some, some of my own pesto tonight. I'm not going to think about that because 10 minutes from now, I'm going to be sitting and watching the new Looney Tunes show with my daughters. I'm just living a life. Why would I sit around thinking about residual racism of that kind? And I guess I'm supposed to because I'm supposed to think that that residual racism is why Omar is in the ghetto. But I don't see the connection the way other people do. Okay, yet, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going very now. finished. But on Twitter right now, I'm not going to identify who it was, but a very prominent black mover, shaker, professor, talker, thinker was saying yesterday, I'm sitting here in tears. That was their tweet. I'm sitting here in tears. Why, why and I didn't have to wonder about why, what. Why the anonymity? I don't, I don't understand that. It was Eddie Glaude. Mm -hmm. and oh, my God. I'm sitting here in tears. And I'm just thinking... Think about how he's seeing all this. About George Floyd? Oh, I'm done. he's thinking Floyd, Central Park, okay, Aubrey, he's in tears. all at the he's same in tears. time. Okay. And Eddie Glaude is not an idiot. You know, you no, can't say, oh, he's crazy. But he's his way idiot, of thinking of all this is so different from ours. And I find myself trying to plumb that kind of brain to see what is it that has you sitting there crying. Well, why doesn't your religion, this is what I was going to say, and forgive me for interrupting, why doesn't your no. religion uh, uh, account explain this? Why, why isn't this uh, the witness, the equivalent of uh, being a witness to God moving in our midst? I mean, it, you know, if, if your worldview is that, you know, unrelenting white supremacy uh, manifesting itself even in the 21st century, uh, blighting the lives of so many African Americans, of all African Americans, of a country that's dripping in racism, et cetera, and I, you know, ad nauseum. If that's your view, then why not cry? Why wouldn't you be swept up by emotion? Why, why, why wouldn't this be a confirmation of everything that you thought? Why wouldn't this be the second, like the second coming of Christ? I mean, 
you know, this, this is proof that the scripture and what the scripture foretells shall indeed come to pass. This is a confirmation of everything that they want to believe in. This is, it's awful. It's horrible. It's horrible. Black Lives Matter. Don't they know that? Kind of thing like that. <laughs> you know, when in fact, as I say, you know, the main. I wish I could fully. You know, though, I, I have worked out an understanding. But he's in tears, really? And, and you don't think that's a performance? You don't think he's writing that? Because that's what the uh, person in his position is supposed to say. That's not dramatic. He's not going to go on Morning Joe because he goes on Morning Joe regularly and, and enact this, uh, this uh, elaborate ritual of lament and, uh, you know, regret and uh, resignation and, you know, and all of that. All right. You know, it's, you know, we can't win here. He either considers us beneath contempt and has no idea what we're saying. He doesn't give a damn doesn't. what we say about it. He, don't need, or, he doesn't need to. Nobody cares what we're saying here, John. Or if it gets uh, back to him. Of, of his ilk. The, the if people it gets who back to him, we're risking. The morning Joe show don't care what we say here. <laughs> we're risking him writing us in indignation. But is it a performance? A little. Yes, it is. But it's a performance that and he's going to say, how dare you say that I'm performing? It's a performance that he's doing for what he thinks of as a genuinely urgent reason. I don't doubt that for a moment. And neither do I doubt that Charles Blow is genuinely committed to what he believes, right. but he's also performing. I mean, you know. Yeah, yes, I don't want to admit it. That's what my book is going to be about. What is that performance? It's a religious performance. And there's a reason for it in their minds, but it doesn't help as much as they think it does. That's the thing. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, they, I was going to be on Morning Joe a couple of weeks ago, and he was going to be one of the panelists. We were going to talk about 1619. Instead, they used Clarence Page. I was supposed to do that. And I pulled out about 48 hours before because I didn't see the point. I Once I realized it's going to be me against three people, I figured I'm going to get to say two things. That was a mistake, three. John. That was a mistake. No, 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 no. no. I don't know what would I have contributed except to have looked like a jerk, you know. If, unless they're going to have it be two people. Well, we can go into it, but let's finish your thought. It's, a, you it's called on. the courage. It's called the courage of your convictions. I don't think anybody would have heard me, but um, yeah, I know you, what you he would does have on heard, morning, Joe. And he since it is a performance. All of us are performers to an extent, but yeah, it is a performance. But it's not insincere. He puts it on a little bit because he thinks that he's leading his people to a better place. That's the thing. But yeah, there's a. It's not shooting straight from the hip about the, the nature of the issues. And I think that people like him feel that that's necessary given the urgency of the situation. I right, politely Sha disagree. Sha okay, yeah. well, I want to reiterate my analysis, which when we discussed the 1619 Project a few weeks ago, um, I first set out, which is uh, that I think all of this has to do with the uh, terrible conditions of the lower uh, class of African-American society in terms of human development, uh, which is manifest across a wide variety of, uh, of indicators of social behavior, including violent crime is one of them, but school failure and, and the family structured things. And, you know, they, they, uh, we, we are well into the 21st century and we've got this, uh, we've got the situation in these cities all around the country and all these controversies and conflicts. Um, and uh, the, the framework of uh, sort of progressive reform from the late 20th century is, is exhausted and the political vehicles for it are impotent. Uh, this is uh, Joe Biden. That, I mean, again, I, you know, Joe Biden says, uh, if you have trouble uh, figuring out whether it's me or Donald Trump you want to vote for, you ain't black and everybody gets upset about it. But the, to me, the most uh, disturbing part of Joe Biden's uh, uh, interview with uh, Charlemagne the God at the Breakfast Club, which has been much discussed, was the pandering and the and the supposition that black people could be basically uh, moved around like chips on a chessboard. Uh, that you know, I, I've been with you. The NAACP endorsed me. I got all these votes in South Carolina. Like this, this black thing, that blackness into which Joe Biden just happens to be tapping because he was Barack's, he was Barack's vice president. He just happens to be tapping into this thought to this well of blackness. That was the thing that uh, that uh, that that so troubled me. Um, and there are all these issues. I mean, you can just go down the list of all of these issues: the overrepresentation of uh, blacks in the mortality of the COVID uh, pandemic, 
uh, the exam school debate in uh, how you get your kid into a really good public school in New York City, uh, the, the crime bill and the, you know, decriminalizing marijuana or legalizing marijuana is now a black issue somehow. I mean, there are these, you know, voter suppression. We're supposed to be back in the day of Jim, uh, Jim Crow or whatnot, and, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and uh, Biden just seemed to be, uh, you know, should I, I'm, I will appoint a black woman to the US Supreme Court. Why is that meaningful? Why, why does that move the needle on any political indicator? Uh, things have become so divorced from, in my view, the substance of, 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 of what's actually happening. So performative, uh, so virtue signaling driven, uh, so herdish in, in the behavior that's presumed about people, so drenching in race and racial essentialism. Uh, you know, if I were a leftist like Adolf Reed, I'd have a full-throated critique here because there's actually a structural class dynamic, which is the driving engine of history. If I were leftist, that's what I'd point to. And these people with their superficial uh, uh, romance with this uh, fiction of, of, of this, of this as being anything, as meaning something deep about human beings, uh, have missed the actual show. I'm not a leftist, but I think they're missing the show. I think they're definitely missing what's actually going on. And the violence issue is, is, to my mind, a quintessential illustration of this. There are threats to the integrity of the Black body. There really are. They are monumental in their quantitative scale. And they are completely unaddressed in this mobilization. Nobody's even talking about them. You know, this is where this all comes down to, is that you know, you're saying all that, and kind of person we're thinking about just thinks Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And what you and I are thinking is that the cops are hideously undertrained and the United States has a gun problem. And that at least I'm thinking that very relevant, that, in, the, uh, very relevant in the Georgia case. That has more than 50% to do with both of those cases, I think. It's a problem with the cops and not racism. And it's a problem with guns. But for the other people, that just won't do. It has to be about skin color. And therefore, it's important to have Stacey Abrams, who I think is great, but Stacey Abrams as a vice president, because she can represent the Black viewpoint, because Black people get knees on their necks. You know, that's the, the sense of it. There has to be a Black Supreme Court justice who's a woman, because one, women's issues, but also that person, unlike Clarence Thomas, will understand that the essence of being black is being looked down upon, somebody you know, calling the cops on you in the park and calling the cops on you because you're wearing black socks and putting their knee on your neck and shooting you while you're jogging. That's how you and I differ here. And I think it's a pretty clear case that we're not crazy. We're not, we're not crazy. We can't be heard by those other people, but we're not insane. But I'm walking around with Arbery and Central Park and George Floyd thinking, what do we have to say in our defense? Because that sort of thing is what creates this 1619 mindset. This is manna from the heavens for them. I'm sure that if you did an EKG on them, you would see their happiness centers lighting up as well as their crying centers. They need this as proof. They really see this as the way America works. I just want us to make sure that we have our defense ready. I think we've kind of put it out, but we can't just say nothing and we, no offense, but we can't just say it's a moral abomination. That, that how people I'm not are offended by that. And if, 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 okay, we, we, but I'm not saying to only say that. So <laughs> at no point did I just say that, but no, I, you I do think that should be said. No. But I want to say something about Stacey Abrams because I think the differences between us are as interesting as the things that we agree about against the world. We agree about a lot of stuff against the world, but there's some stuff that we disagree about. And, uh, Stacey Abrams would be one of them. I'm not an admirer of hers. Uh, her claim to fame is that she lost an election. She never conceded that election in Georgia. She lost an election because of something called voter suppression. So she's supposed to be the real governor of Georgia right now, when in fact, if she hadn't have been so liberal in her political program, if, for example, she'd been pro-life, I'm not saying she should be, but if she had been, if she'd been a Republican, she'd probably be governor of Georgia right now. 
this is again this issue of what does race got to do with it i mean race is one of the things that determines the outcome of elections but it's not the only thing that determines the outcome of election why would i reduce all of politics to the pigmentation of the politician that that's that's a very silly thing it seems to me to do the theory of representation that legitimates that reduction is a demonstrably wrong in my view theory of what democratic representation should be we're not representing races here we're representing interests interests are many and they're not only racial so uh yes i know brian kemp is he that guy that won that election he was secretary of state and some polling places were closed and some people disagreed about this or that aspect of the organization of the election i'm not an expert on it so there well may be more than a little bit to discuss and I'm aware of the fact that the Voting Rights Act uh, was gutted by the Supreme Court's decision that uh, allowed some of the administrative changes and uh, running of elections in Georgia to be done free of the supervision of the U.S. Department of Justice in the uh, Federal District Court of the, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., and that that's relevant in a discussion here. And I'm not trying to dismiss that discussion about, mm -hmm. uh, about voter ID and, and whatnot. There's much to be said about it. The point I'm making is simply this. Uh, Stacey Abrams' refusal to concede that election based upon some claim about voter suppression uh, is uh, reprehensible, in my view. It's reprehensible. You have elections. When you lose, you concede the election. Uh, you're basically inviting uh, the delegitimation of the entire structure of uh, democratic representation when you do that. Based upon a theoretical claim about race, like I said, if she had altered her program in its specific content about what she wanted to do for the people of Georgia, just a little bit to the center, she would have probably won the election. Well, you know, we shouldn't get on to her because we're, we're coming close. Okay, because we don't have enough time to do it. I just, justice. very quickly, I think that the voter suppression is real. And I think that we talked about this back in the day. There's a difference between not wanting black people to vote because you think that they're animals and not wanting black people to vote based on a revoltingly Machiavellian pragmatism about trying to reduce the Democrat vote so that Republicans will win. It's a disgusting practice, but to pretend that it's the same as how Senator Vardaman felt in 1903 is melodramatic. She hasn't done that. That's not her point. I say that her, the stand that she took, I want this voter suppression to stop, one, because it's morally wrong, and two, I guess it gets to the point where you're, tr you're trying to cover up gopher holes and something else is always going to come up, but that voter suppression is something else that keeps the, the theater going, because a lot of people pretend that what that is is the same thing as what was going on during the time of lynching. Asking people to present an ID before they cast a ballot is the same thing as suppressing their uh, right to vote? It is not. Well, you know, a lot of people pretend that that's true. And I don't mean Stacey Abrams. I've never heard her say that. Well, why but, wouldn't the reaction to pre people presenting an ID uh, being a necessity to vote be get people IDs? They need IDs for a lot of things, not just for voting. A person well, without I, an ID is disadvantaged in the society. Why isn't there a movement to make sure that everybody has an ID? Why isn't universal ID the battling cry? Well, I asked Al Sharpton that once, and he said that there are two parts. One is getting everybody an ID, but the other is decrying the voter suppression. And this was late, Al Sharpton, the one where we argue, where I say that now he's, he's okay. But he said we can talk about both things at the same time. But let me put it differently. Is there no legitimacy in having there be skin in the game for people who want to cast the ballot, for example? If I say you should show up in person, I'm not saying that this is my position. It's not my position. And I know that Trump doesn't want people to mail in ballots. And I know it's a very touchy situation. But I'm just saying, in principle, the idea that I would ask something of a person before they cast a ballot, I would not simply make it as easy as it could possibly be. I'd want there to be some, why is that wrong? Why is that racist? Why is that anti-democratic? It's not anti-democratic to ask people to be citizens. I mean, you know, to ask them to actually take on some responsibility in casting a ballot. I'm not saying that that's my position. I want to reiterate that. Sure. I want to say that it's an arguable question. And on the other side of it, you would have to say, well, no, that would uh, be too much of a burden on people. And then we'd be start, start talking about the burdens of citizenship. 
And the, the, the thing is, though, why are they suddenly being so picky about it? And I think the reason is obvious. Oh, well, yeah, and you're saying Republicans are doing it strategically yeah. in order to keep people away from the polls. And yeah, OK. Yeah. But that's another topic. But it I is. think we have made a case. And so I, I just wanted to be clear for anybody. What's the case you want to summarize? Arbery and the Central Park case with the birders, with the birder and the, um, the murder of George Floyd do not deep six the thoughts of quote unquote contrarians like you and me. There are other ways of looking at the terrible things that happened to all three of those people, particularly Arbery and Floyd. And I don't want to speak for you, Glenn, but I'm not, this is not me working against what I see as obvious disproof. I've really thought about this. I've really thought, look at this. Where is it that the mainstream take on this is going wrong? And I honestly believe that thinking of it as being about race, as you do, you agree with me on this, is reflexive. It's just not as clear as we're being told. And to insist that it must be about race is like somebody saying on a video blog that they just know that Brett Kavanaugh did what he did. <laughs> oh, you're reading the comments, John. You're reading the comments. <laughs> I did for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just know. It's That's very moral. much. It's very much like that. I'm so glad you recalled that thing. It's it's <laughs> the, it's the same mistake. This yeah. thing that you don't have proof for, but you just know it's true, and you that's can't a, just know. That's mischievous. John McWhorter, yeah. Columbia University, my partner here at bloggingheads.tv. We're the Black Guys, and we have uh, put in another conversation. Thanks so much, John. People are going to be upset with you about what you've had to say. Not me. Everything I said is <laughs> universally endorsed. <laughs> With signing off for now, let's talk again soon. We will.